So, hi everyone, I am Artie, and I'm going to talk to you about something that I'm really passionate about, and unfortunately, I see it being misused quite often. I'm going to talk about type. Now, type is amazing, and you know, it's really difficult to avoid reading at least something every day, you know, books, magazines, etc. Um, and everything that we read has been put together by somebody, you know, usually by multiple people, for one sole purpose, for you to read it. And, you know, over the course of our history, we became really, really good at putting all sorts of symbols on all sorts of materials. But, in comparison, the web is only about 30 years old, and we really started to obsess about um, aesthetics of web design, you know, fairly recently. Um, so, I'm going to talk about type and how it can be used to create an amazing user experience, or, if used badly, remove any sort of trust in our service and our website. So, to use a cliché phrase, uh, content is king. And most of said content is something you read. Now, type is beautiful. It gives character, a tone of voice. Um, it can really make or break any, you know, the most eloquently written copy. So, consider the tone of voice in the following passage. Now, I'm sure it's going to be a really great birthday party, but the tone of voice is just slightly wrong. And the font, Baskerville, is completely out of place. So very briefly, Baskerville is what is called a transitional typeface. It is the point in time when we started to move away from the uh, older processes of the Gutenberg Press and all that kind of stuff into a more modern world. And it's been designed in the 1700s, it's an absolute classic, and you would probably use it anywhere else but a kid's birthday invite. Here's another one. Hey, the much hated or loved, depends what camp you're in, Comic Sans. Um, Comic Sans has been designed in 94, it's a Windows default font. It's really cool, it's really wacky, it's really, you know, it's inspired by comic books, it's as if it's written by hand. And um, it proved to be very popular when it came out. In fact, it became so popular that people started using it absolutely everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, there is a time and a place for anything, including Comic Sans. In fact, there are some evangelical types out there um, that say that it's really great for dyslexia. If you are one of them, please see me after. So, before we move on, just enjoy that for a sec. Um, a quick story. So, back in 2012, film uh, filmmaker and writer by the name of Errol Morris ran an experiment in the New York Times called, Are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? In this experiment, people had to write, to read, sorry, some passages, and then answer some true or false questions. About 40,000 people sent in their answers, but here's the twist. Mr. Morris wasn't actually interested in optimism or pessimism. He was more interested in how different type affects how you believe things, or whether it makes things more believable. So the passages ranged from Baskerville and Comic Sans that we saw earlier. And what he found is that stories written in Baskerville were more likely to be believed. And you know, you can pretty much you know, guess where Comic Sans was sitting on that. So, um, before we move, on, we move on, I need to get a bit technical. So, in any discipline, I think it's really, really important to speak the same language. So, don't try and remember everything. I'll be super, super quick. So, tracking, or I think it's called letter spacing in CSS, um, is how the text is spaced. It's the space between all characters. It's used to make text looser or tighter. Sometimes you can go a bit overboard on both sides of that spectrum and it will become really, really weird looking. Next thing is leading. Leading is the height between lines. Again, this will make it feel looser or tighter, but in height, um, this is line height. Uh, so tight leading can be really difficult to read as well as really loose. By the way, fun geeky fact. Um, so in the olden days, old school printers used to put thin lines of lead in between lines of printed text and that's why it's called leading. And the last thing is kerning. Now you can't get kerning to be controlled in CSS without getting super complicated but it's still useful to keep at the back of your mind when designing things or looking at different designs. Um, 
because with kerning, you're in danger of making one word look like two, or you know, two letters that are very similar to each other look like one letter. Often to really hilarious effect. And by the way, you can Google it, that kerning afterwards. You're gonna love it, honestly. So, there are two things I really want to speak to you about today. Um, but before that, I'll tell you another big story which will hopefully put things into context. So, in 2007, there was a study run um, in which participants had to read some passages of text written in different fonts and then make uh, complete a cognitive task. And the researchers were trying to find a new measure for aesthetics, typographic aesthetics for human computer interaction, which is actually quite important for us as designers because we want our amazing copy not only to be read, but you know, also hopefully remembered and understood. So the study found that um, the participants who completed the task with good typography completed it faster and felt generally better about doing it. So they decided that the two measures are going to be comfort of speed and retention of information, or as we simplify it, legibility and readability. And these are the exactly two things that I really want to talk to you about because they are the, what influence our designs. So, legibility. As you can see there, legibility is to do with small details of individual characters and how text is seen. The things I mentioned just back there, like lighting and tracking, they do affect it, especially tracking, but it's mostly down to color, size and contrast. There is a bit of an overlap between legibility and readability, um, but generally speaking, if something is legible, sorry, if something is not legible, it's definitely not going to be readable. Whereas something that is re uh, legible can be really difficult to read. In the first example, uh, you can see that the text is a little bit <coughs> too grey, almost invisible. There was this trend a few years back to make everything grey, because apparently it was easier on the eyes. Um, you can see the issue with it here. It looks fine on my laptop screen, ish, but it kind of breaks down when you take it on a bigger screen. It's especially bad if you were sitting on a mobile outside in bright sun. That would be completely invisible. So in this one, the contrast now is way too high. It's definitely legible, but reading it would probably give you a headache, especially if it's in a dark room. On my supermarket, in design, we use a shade of gray that is just off black, like this. <coughs> It's a little bit easier on the eyes um, than using pure black, but the contrast is high enough so you don't have any problems when you're switching media. Another example. It's a very, very common situation when you're designing a component <coughs> that is going to be reused elsewhere. And you can see in the heading there, motorbike insurance, stands out quite nicely against a dark background. It ties in with the guy's shirt, it generally looks all right. But because it's a reusable component, situation like this can happen. You replace the image and then suddenly it all breaks down. Now obviously this is a very drastic example. It won't happen in real life. In real life, people are going to have to spend quite a lot of their time scrolling through pages and pages of stock photography for many, many days to find the right thing. <laughs> Would that be you? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the, so the next example I picked out because it perfectly illustrates the fact that something can work really well for print, but will definitely not work for web. This blog is designed in the best traditions of print design. There's plenty of white space, the text is in two columns, good variety of sizes. Um, but can you really tell what this is by just looking at it? All the key information is hidden in this really tiny, tiny, tiny text above it. And this happens to be somebody's portfolio. So all the stuff like client, media, you know, time scales, company, etc. This is all hidden away and you need to go in and actually search for it. Here's another example. Pretty design with completely useless typography. Originally, I thought this is a conference program. Can you imagine my surprise when I realized that this is actually somebody portfolio? And to find that out, I had to properly read into it. The text is tiny, it was a complete pain, and I had to search for all the key information. 
On the opposite end of that scale, you have pages like this. The text is reasonably spaced, the legend is quite relaxed, and the contrast is okay. Even without looking at the little washing machine icons on the side there, you can pretty much tell straight away that this has something to do with clothes. And in fact it is, it's a, it's a clothes, um, like a retailer shop. <coughs> Moving on. Whereas legibility is to do with seeing the text properly, readability deals with how the overall copy is structured. Complexity of the text really affects it, but this is more for copywriters, I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to talk about the visual side of things. Um, I found a couple of examples here. Lovely. So, this is an antique bottle website. Apart from generally strange design choices, from usability point of view, it's okay. I mean, there's a menu on the side with really bad type, there's the heading with really bad type, and there's a wall of text that nobody's going to read. I would say that generally it feels really overwhelming and very unwelcoming. Even if you were a huge fan of antique bottles, would you really want to read through that? Probably not. Um, so, funnily enough, this is a fairly old resource. I found it on a blog somewhere, and I thought, hey, maybe in 2017 the guy had the chance to redesign it. And he did! Look at that. Now, visually, it's an okay improvement, but looking at the page here, you can pretty much tell that Type was not really the first priority here. You can see the labels on the bottles completely illegible and unreadable. The font in the menu makes it really hard to read. And what is that? What does that even say? Scrolling down, you are presented with the same wall of completely unbroken text. Nobody's going to read that. But there are things you can do here. And um, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I went into the browser editor and started tinkering. So before I show you <coughs> what I did, I'm just going to tell you. So I made the line text a little bit smaller. Line, sorry, width. Um, I upped the text size, I upped the lighting a little bit, and I removed those weird wrapping images. And this took only about three minutes. Three minutes of my life to make it way better. I'm not saying this is the greatest design of my entire life, but it's pretty difficult to argue that this is a way, this is an improvement. There are other things you can do to break up text. You can insert a pull quote that will break it up nicely. You can put emphasis on certain parts of the paragraph to hopefully intrigue the user into reading more and give them a visual anchor to start with. But ultimately, if you know what you're doing, and if you know the basics, you don't actually need any of that stuff you can pretty much guarantee a really great user experience by just getting the basics right. The next example shows this. I really like this page. This is uh, from New Yorker magazine. It started off as a sophisticated humor magazine, and it definitely has that character. The typography is really simple. It's very, very usable, and it kind of gives you a sense that you're reading a real magazine article. And even, nobody uses these anymore. But it's a great way to break up text, it's the little M dashes, the longest, the longest dash you can get. It's really great. So at this point, everybody's probably wondering, what has all this to do with Gotham? You were from Gotham. Now, everything, really. It's our brand font, and as any font, it can be very, very easy to misuse it. So we need to learn how to use it. <coughs> so when it was first designed, the type designer actually walked around New York looking at sides of buildings and signs. Um, so you can pretty much say that it was not designed to be subtle, it was not designed to be small, it was designed to be read from a very, very large distance, and it, could, it was designed to be as loud as possible. Now, in our brand, we mostly use Gotham Ultra, the heaviest and the boldest of the family. It can look really, really great on maybe a TV ad, or you know, as a header thing, or a billboard. But when you take it into mobile, especially on very, very small screen sizes, it kind of breaks down. You can see that the kerning is off, the letters crash into each other, the line height is off. From a distance, it's not very readable, or in fact, legible. So again, <coughs> I took matters into my hands, started tinkering, and here. This is still Gotham, just slightly lighter in weight. This is still our brand but it's legible and it's a lot more readable. So next time you're 
writing an article or you know designing a page in HTML or reviewing somebody else's design, I implore you to use good typography or at least consider it because the notion of really bad type out there on the web, we can be either the ones that do it wrong or the one of the few that get it right, like the New Yorker and our copy people want to read. So with all the tools that are available to us, really there isn't an excuse to use bad type. And I've been preparing for this, it's going to sound cheesy, but really be the hero Gotham needs. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>